Hey makers, this is Colin from Make Haven, and this is the Form Labs 3D 3D printer. So the first thing about the Form Labs printer is that it is a SLA printer, which means it uses resin, and that's partially why it's this funky orange color. Uh, there's resin in here that is sensitive to UV light. So this is a UV filtering canopy here. And uh, just to note, you don't want to be lifting and, and, and closing the cap all the time because that's, that's harming the life of the resin that sits in the bottom here. Real quick, we're just going to go through all the components of the system because it's a little bit different from an FDM. Uh, this is the printer itself. And then over here, we have a wash bin, which is actually full of isopropyl alcohol. And then over here, we have the curing station, which uh, puts UV light as well as heat, as well as airflow uh, around the part to make it fully cure. So now let's get into the printer itself. Um, the material for the printer is stored back here. It's a little tank. I'll pull another one out. Just so, you can see it. so this is what your print material in a resin printer looks like. You can see that this one is tough, 1500. So this is a, a higher strength version. The one that's in the printer right now is called White. It's a, more of a multi-purpose not for engineering purposes or anything structural, but it does a really good job of just making really high quality models. So this is an example of the kinds of prints you can get with uh, a printer like this. The thing about resin printing is that it can do extremely high detail. So it may not have a really large build volume like you have in some FDM printers, uh, but it does do really high accuracy high detail parts. So it's great for figurines um, and it's great for some other cool applications like uh, you can make uh, injection molds with it uh, and then pull injection molded plastic parts out of it. So uh, a lot of really cool applications. They use it in the surgical world as well because you can make resins that are uh, bio safe. So people are doing all sorts of really cool stuff with that. Um, the next version of um, plastic that we have down here in stock is the high temp. And this is for, like I mentioned, injection molding. So if you want to make a mold, uh, you would 3D print the mold and then you would put, in, put it in an aluminum casing or steel casing. And then you would put that together and then pull plastic into it. So that's a really cool capability. So to note, we have three materials right now. There's the white, as I mentioned, the tough, and then high temp. And we have dedicated trays. Uh, like you see in the bottom here, we have a tray. And this is just the case for the tray. But after, when you change a material, you'll take that tray out, put it in this case, and then put it on a UV filtered cap there. So you don't have to worry about the resin curing accidentally. Uh, but we do need to keep these in their respective shelves so things don't get mixed up. As well as the platforms. Uh, this is a build platform for a resin printer. And because it's a resin printer, instead of printing right side up, it's actually printing upside down. You can see the one in there. And the way it works is it goes down the z-axis and it dips it into the resin. And then it shoots lasers at it from below. and uh, hardens that layer that's right next to uh, the vat, the bottom of that tray. So then it picks it up, it puts it back down a little bit, but it puts it down a little bit less. So it's slightly higher relative to the, the bottom of the tray. And then it shoots another layer uh, at the resin and hardens it. And then it does the same thing, brings it up, brings it down, and it goes all the way up the part like that. So, um, we want to have a, a platform for each type of material. Right now we have a white platform and a white tray and the white material. And so all that stuff is going to stay on each of these shelves. After printing and you pull this platform off, uh, you're going to put it into the wash bin. 
So the way the wash bin works is it has a little screen. If this is black, you can just push the button and it will uh, come to life like it just has. Um, I'm just going to end that wash. So when you hit uh, open, it'll do this. And the reason that's helpful is because if you have small parts, they'll end up in here. But uh, more usefully is this top bracket up here. So you're going to take your print, open up the canopy, you're going to open this handle, and you're going to grab this platform here. This is going to be your upside down print here, so it's going to be hanging. And then you're going to slide it onto the platform there. Close this so that nothing cures. And then you're going to go down to the start. You see it t says 10 minutes and then sleep. Uh, for fresh IPA, it should be 10 minutes. If it isn't washing, you can go in here and turn up the amount of time that it's washing. But we're just going to leave it for 10 minutes so you can go up to start. And when you select start, it will lower the platform and begin the wash process. So one of the things about the wash bin that's really important is that the isopropyl alcohol, or IPA, is fresh. Uh, and the way that you can check for how strong the alcohol is, is there is a little gauge that they include here uh, that's a buoyancy test. And this little red ring here is set at a certain level based off of uh, when you first put it in, when you have fresh alcohol, you can put it in and set it so that it floats at the line there. So now that it's stabilized, you can see the red ring. Uh, if the red ring ever gets to the top of the fin, that's a sign that the isopropyl alcohol needs to be replaced. Uh, it needs to be refilled sometimes, and you can check that by looking on the front here. There's a kind of a hard to see black line with a slant to it um, and two arrows. The level of the isopropyl alcohol should be in between these two arrows. So if it's lower, which it will be because it kind of evaporates, um, you may have to add some. So one of the things to be aware of with the wash pan is it's full of isopropyl alcohol. So this is a uh, highly volatile alcohol, so it will continually evap evaporate. And that's why it's really important to keep this shut, um, to keep that down. And it is also very flammable. Now that you've done your washing uh, in, the, in the wash bin, uh, you can take out your part. So we're going to go over here and hit open. That's going to raise it for you. And if they haven't detached off of the platform, they'll still be on the platform. But if they do, they'll be caught by this little basket. So you can take out your parts. And this is, between these two is a good time to uh, take your side snips, which are in this little toolkit back here, and you can snip off the supports. So this will more than likely have a lattice structure of support material, which we're going to go over in the software. Uh, so before you put it into the curing uh, chamber, you're just going to want to snip off as much as you can of the support. Let me mention the other tool for getting the prints off. Oh yeah. I'm just starting to think about that. I've got to close this thing because it's like making my eyes <laughs> So in terms of getting the part off of the platform, um, there is a little tool for you that's uh, just a very sharp, or not very sharp, but just a kind of a flat blade so that you can, you can uh, get it underneath the, uh, the build platform. It is really important not to dig the corner of this into your build platform so, so we don't damage it, but um, that's what you use that for. And then if you need to, there's also a spatula to uh, scrape things off if it's uh, a lot, very shallow thing, uh, and some tweezers if you need them. So if you want to change materials with the 
the Formlabs 3D printer, uh, this is how you do it. There's the resin in the back, uh, and on the top, there's a cap. Um, it may not be actually detached like this. This is a little bit of a weird one. But um, you're going to want to make sure before you take this out that you screw this back on it until it's tight. Make sure I've got a good thread. I felt like I was maybe cross thread it. Okay, so now that that's done, you can just pull this tub out, and there's your material. So this is going to go into the, the white um, chamber, and then we're going to go over here and get our case out. Take off the top. And this is what we're going to put the tray into. Grab that. Just pull it up a little bit. And very carefully. Oops. And make sure it snaps all around. And that's how it's stored. So we're going to use the same material uh, this time, but if you want to pull out a different material, this is when you would go grab a different material, pull off the top, and then the, the little extra tab out here is what goes in the back. Definitely only goes in one way. You're gonna you're gonna lower it and then move it backwards. Is the motion, and you should feel something. And then it just it slides in there. So there's a click on the way out, and it's recognized that I've inserted the cartridge. The graphic went away, but so now you can see it says. tank white v4 so it says it's missing the cartridge so we're going to go to our cartridge slide it in. You, sh you should hear a little audio tone from the interface so now it has recognized that we have the tank so one thing to note is uh, when you put the cartridge in or, or whenever you're using it, you want to make sure that this cap is loose. Uh, the reason for that is because this is literally the tank. So if this is screwed all the way tight, the fluid won't be allowed to escape because there's no air to replace it. So we just got to take this off or make sure it's loose so that air can enter as it's printing. So while it's printing, uh, one good thing to kind of take note of is if it ever says it's not level, um, you just go over to maintenance and choose level. And there should be these things under at least a couple of the, the feet of the printer. This is a leveling disc. And the way it works is it uh, indexes with the actual feet of the printer and you kind of slide it in until you feel it click and you just turn it and the interface will tell you which direction to turn each foot. It'll have a little arrow and you just turn it and it will have a little level in the center where it tells you if it's level or which feet need to be adjusted. Go, go over how to use the Preform, which is the software used for the Formlabs printer. Um, so there are a bunch of ways that printing an SLA is different than printing on FDM. So we're just going to go over those. Sorry. So I'm going to load a file that I just downloaded from Thingiverse. So in terms of the STLs that you bring in, um, those, you know, in terms of the file type and whatnot, that's pretty much the same. There are some other considerations for how you um, design those files. So I'm just going to open, and this is the part that I downloaded. So I brought it over here, and I'm just going to turn it by accident. Okay, not doing a great job. Going to click on this and move it over here. 
and now we want to orient it properly so that the flat bottom is pointed towards the bottom. And this is something that's, that's pretty different about printing an SLA. So if we were to print this directly, the flat piece on the bottom, which we could do, um, it, would, uh, it would be very difficult to remove. So it says here, it actually says printability not good because it prints directly on build platform. Um, so we try to avoid that. So what we're gonna do is go over here and we're just gonna kinda go down the list. You could do auto, uh, it's called one click print, but we're just gonna go through the settings. So uh, just one other quick point before I forget is you're gonna be logged into your account. Right now we're logged into Colin's account and that's gonna keep track of, of all your prints. So just make sure to log into your account and log out of your account when you're done. So this is just size, pretty straightforward. If you want to change the size of your print, um, we can leave it as is. These are orientation features, so we'll click auto orient and see what happens. So it's calculating something and it did a great job. It put it just where we wanted. Uh, no, it totally did not, I take that back. So it's elevated off at this weird angle. So what we're gonna do is orient to face. So we're gonna select the base and then we're gonna look at the bottom of this and click right there and tell it that's the bottom actually. So just using the right click to right key on the mouse to rotate our view. Um, so we're done with that. And now over here, you could orient the axes in different way, bounding boxes, that's uh, not terribly important. Something interesting to note is there are all these little information buttons next to things. So make sure to click on those if you wanna read more on the website. So we have our supports here and that's pretty important. So we have no supports right now to edit. So we can cancel that um, and go back here. And so these are a bunch of uh, bits and pieces that are important to know about. So supports are a little bit different in SLA than they are in FDM. Uh, first of all, a raft is pretty much required and that's to make it easier to get off. So you will see a video in a second of what it looks like when you print directly to the base and it's really hard to remove, so you don't want that. So a full raft is it puts a raft under the entire print, but let's say you had, you're making a bridge, you know, from, from one, um, you know, like that, you wouldn't necessarily need a raft into the whole thing. You could just have what they call mini rafts, and that would be a raft under each side of the bridge. Um, but in this case, we want a full raft. Then you can put a la raft label. So if you select raft label, that just puts the name of your print on the raft. Not terribly important, unless you want that for some reason. Normally the raft comes off anyways and goes in the trash. The density, so you'll see this in a minute, the, what the, the way that the raft works here is that uh, it makes a base, and that base is at an angle to make it easier to pry off, and then it has these little pylons that go and connect it to all the bits that need supporting on, the, on your print and you can control the density of that. So right here, um, right now it's set to one. Let's say you wanted a really dense, a lot of little pylons touching on your piece, a lot of touch points, then you could increase that. Touch point size is how big those points are when they're contacting your piece. So you can make those bigger or smaller. Internal supports can be important. If you're trying to print a sphere or something, then you need to put supports inside of it. Um, flat spacing. So these are a little more advanced that aren't terribly important. These are sort of to compensate for problems if you have problems. So you can read more about that on their, on their website. Um, we don't need to get into that right now. So uh, we have the settings as we want, so we're gonna auto-generate selected. And it's doing its thing. So this is what it created for us. So we're gonna look at this a little more closely. So it has this big raft on the bottom with this draft angle, which will make it easy to remove. And then these, these supports coming and they're touching all over the thing to help hold it in place so that uh, it prints straight and true and whatnot. So then we're gonna go over here 
And this is actually indicating our printer. So this might actually pop up when you open the program, but we're just gonna open it up here. And this is saying the printer we're using. So this is correct that we're using the, what's called the Direct Kudu, which is just the name of our printer. And it's saying that the cartridge is white and the tank is the same, the resin, the white resin, so that's good. Um, that the status is idle. And uh, these are just, if you wanted to use virtual printers, if you wanted to pretend that you had a fuse one, then you could do that, but we don't really care about that. Then we want for our print, the resin to be white, so that's good, version, sure. The resolution is important here, so if you want it to be the highest resolution, a really fine print, it'll take longer, but you can select that. Or you could say, no, I want it to be fast, and put it over here. With different resins, you can have different resolutions, so um, bear that in mind when you change, if you select a different resin. So let's say up here, we actually put in a different resin, then we would want to select that down here to make sure that the model we were building matched what we had in the machine. So that's pretty good. And now we're gonna look over here and everything's hunky-dory. So it's liking what we're doing. It says the volume is 2.92 milliliters. So that's the, the volume of liquid resin that we're gonna be using. And as we mentioned, we, uh, we charge for the resin by milliliter. So since this is the white resin, it says right next to it that it's 20 cents per milliliter. So you just multiply 2.92 by the 20 cents and pay that either in the cash box right over there on the wall or on the Make Haven website. Um, then printability says thumbs up, minima. So minima are weird places that would be difficult for it to print. Um, and then cups. So imagine you were printing a, a say a, a sphere or a cup or something, you would create a suction cup underneath it. And um, as it's printing up and up, the resin wouldn't be able to get in and it would pop or break or something not good. So it would give you a warning if it detected a cup and then you could just like tilt it on its side or put a hole in it, some way for air to get in and resin to escape. So we'll touch on that a little more in a minute. So one of the other things over here that we can look at is the layout. So over here you can change, if you have a bunch of models on here, the spacing, you can duplicate them if you want a whole bunch of these, if you want an array, if you want to mirror them to make the mirror image of a print. Uh, so that's kind of nifty. And then I want to show you on their website the list of recommendations they have for how to design your 3D prints to be successful. So I'm just going to click on here to bring it to the Formlab support site for the 3B, which is our printer. Um, and I'm just going to go to maybe up here. This isn't actually, that's not the page that I wanted. So we're going to look at design specifications for 3D models, which is what we want. And this just sort of tells you how you want to design your print so that it's successful. So how thick the walls can be so that it can uh, print them well, supported wall thickness, if you have overhangs, how it recommends you try to do those, uh, different angles, having unsupported spans, little vertical pieces, details like that, whether they're uh, embossed or engraved, uh, clearances between parts, they don't fuse together, hole diameters. So these are things that you'd want to refer to if you're doing some really smaller bits and pieces to make sure that um, it was gonna work for you. These are some of the best practices on the Formlab site that it recommends to make sure you get good prints. So we'll just go through them quickly. There are full articles for each of these that I would recommend reading. Um, so uh, just the, the, well, we can just go through the thing here. So in terms of reducing print time, um, it highly recommends um, tilting your pieces. So in the, in the slicer, when it tilted it, actually that was, um, it was doing that intentionally because when you put a slight 10 to 20 degree tilt on it, it increases the success because each layer um, is less connected to the tank and that's a good thing, um, which you can read more about. So at intersections, it's better for intersections to, uh, to start at the, at the bottom and grow outwards versus starting two things and then hoping they come together perfectly later on in the print. Um, overhangs you want to avoid, so orienting the piece to avoid those, and that's part of what the calculation piece over here does when it does its auto-orient. That's what it was figuring out. So what we could do actually here is redo the auto-orient. And 
well, oh yeah, so it put a slight angle on it. So I'll go like that, so now you can see the slight angle that it put on it, and so now we would go back here and auto-generate all of our supports again. And it's figuring this out. And there you go, so now this is the new version that it made based on that piece of information, so that's good to know. Um, reducing minima, suction cups, uh, so if you're printing, so this, this shape is in preform. So something important conceptually is that when you're designing it in preform, it's right side up like normal, but it actually prints upside down. So if you print a piece that looks like this and it's upside down, it makes a suction cup against the bottom and then it can't come up because there's a vacuum inside. So you need to put a little air hole in it to let air in or change the orientation or something like that. Uh, and then just saving changes. So there are a lot of other great things on this website that I would recommend reading. Those are the basics. So we're gonna go back here, and now we're gonna make sure, yep, it still says our printability is good, so we like that. And then uh, we're gonna print. So that's just this orange button over here. I'm gonna click print, and it says idle, everything's good to go. Up, so we click upload job. So once it's finished loading, you'll see it says job uploaded successfully. And it won't start unless you, unless you set it up to, but by default it will not start printing unless you go over here and see the print. And then you just hit print. So it's just making sure that we've opened our event cap, we have. And then that the handle is locked down. The handle is this build platform right here. So you want to make sure that's locked down. We're going to hit confirm. All right, so we're going to take this print out. Uh, and I'm going to make sure not to have this open any longer than it needs to be. So I'm going to lift you up, lift this handle. And you don't really want to get the resin on your hand, so I'm just going to hold it from the top. Drop this back down. And uh, we can look at our teensy little print here. We're gonna put it right in this washing basin. So we're gonna push this, and 10 minutes is good for the fresh IPA, so I'm gonna click open. And the super spaceshipy looking thing is gonna open up for us. Just gonna take our print, load it right in there, and click start. It opened up uh, when it finished, and we're just gonna remove this, and then tell it to go to sleep. We wanna make sure that this is closed as much as possible, so all of that isopropyl alcohol isn't just evaporating into nothingness. Um, I'm then gonna leave this just to dry for about half an hour, and then we're gonna use this tool to pop it off and let it cure in there. So now that this has finished drying for the 30 minutes, we're just gonna take this little removal tool and use it to pop the print right off. Shouldn't be too hard, just like that. And uh, yeah, so now that we have this, we can cure it. And you can either remove the supports before or after a curing. Um, I, I'm gonna remove them after, and you can use the little snips and tweezers and whatnot on the wall to facilitate the removal. Um, so to load this up, you're just gonna put it right in here on the little tray, close it, and it's set for 30 minutes, which is good. So we're just gonna turn that on and it's gonna harden up the resin and then it will be good to go. When you're done with this, um, if there's still the same resin that you're using in the form labs, then you can just put it right back in so they stay together. And, um, and, and this is good to go. If there are still globs of resin, you might just wipe those off to be considerate to the next person.